Constitution, of course, was the 13th Amendment. I'm not talking about the lost 13th Amendment, but I'm talking about the other 13th Amendment where the phrase where I guess the slaves were freed up. But the real thing was the 14th Amendment because the 14th Amendment is the one that, that defined the term citizen of the United States. Now, you have, um, you have two terms in the Constitution that are defined constitu constitutionally. One of them is treason and the other is citizen of the United States. There are no other definitions in the Constitution. And the citizen of the United States, well, what is it? What does it take to be a citizen of the United States? Well, you have to qualify, okay? What are the two qualifications? That's what it names, two qualifications in order to be a citizen. The first qualification is, is you have to either be born here or naturalized. The second qualification to be a citizen of the United States is you have to be subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. See that word? Subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. That is the second requirement for being a citizen. You understand? Subject. The people are sovereign. They're not subject to anybody. At most, if you're one of the people of the United States, you are subject to your fellow sovereigns in the form of grand jury indictment and petite jury 100% conviction, okay? That's a trial by the people, not a trial by the government. When a government does a prosecution, they prosecute on information. They appear with information before the magistrate. The magistrate functions like a one-man grand jury, decides whether or not there's a case there, and of course, as we all know, he usually rubber stamps it to, to tell him, go ahead and do the prosecution. And then you have the next trial, which they say you can have a jury, uh, if you're talking criminal proceedings, but in fact, those juries are advisory juries, okay? About the only place I know where common law might be really used is in an actual murder trial because they actually go and get an indictment. And in other words, to a grand jury, they don't do it on information, they do it on indictment. But then that's questionable too because none of the grand juries in the United States have 25 people. It's always fewer than 25. That's a whole subject area of discussion right there. As to, but basically, they typically have 21 or 23, but not 25. If they had 25, it'd be a real grand jury. So it's a, it's a legislated, statutorily defined grand jury rather than a common law grand jury. If you want a common law grand jury, you get 25. I've kind of played with the thought of what if we got 25 of us together and officially noted notified the government that we are a grand jury and then started investigating. What if we went to the court administrator and said, how about giving us a room we can meet in? <laughs> but again, that's another topic. But uh, if you do want to know about grand juries, read Article 61 of the Magna Carta, which is on this disc. And, they, and you'll see the entire procedure for setting up a grand jury and what the powers of a grand jury are. Anyhow, so the citizens are defined as people who are born or naturalized and subject to the jurisdiction. So if you're subject to the jurisdiction, now you're no longer sovereign. Okay, if you're subject to the jurisdiction, you have a master. After all, to be subject, you gotta have somebody who's subjecting you. Okay, so the preamble, let's look at this a little closer, okay? We start off here, I kind of gave you the overview, now here's the detail. The preamble does not specifically define the word people. Nevertheless, the definition becomes apparent in the context of the other words and prior history. And so prior to the United States, before the United States existed, there was no legal government, a group of representatives acting in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, declared the independence of the colonies from the British crown and the state of Great Britain. And so from the beginning in the 1776 Declaration of Independence, the people were acknowledged as a source of authority. That is the sovereignty which authorized the Declaration of Independence. By the way, President Lincoln considered the Declaration of Independence as our first constitution. 
He said there were three constitutions, and that was the first one. And some people are actually incorporating that in their, uh, in their legal papers, saying that that's, that's the foundation that defines our system. Okay, so next came the Articles of Confederation in 1778, then 1787, the people themselves came forth to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And that's, that gave us a preamble. So here's, let's analyze that preamble because I want you to get a picture of this sovereignty. Okay, here's the full statement. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure, see we have a laundry list of tasks. By the way, everything you see there, everything in there is an element of a trust. You've heard of trust? Okay. We have the people are the trustors. The, uh, the trustees are the United States of America. They, the purpose of the trust, to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, etc. Okay. And the beneficiaries of the trust are ourselves and our posterity. Okay. So the United States of America is not a country. It's the states that are independent, independent countries. It's the United States that, that's a trust, a corporation. How can you tell it's a corporation? It's real easy. All corporations have presidents and vice presidents and secretaries and treasurers. Okay? States have governors. Or countries have governors. Okay, so anyway, we go into the structure of this thing. Here it is. The trustor, we the people. The venue of the United States. The purpose in order to form a more perfect union, etc. And get the blessings of liberty. The beneficiary to ourselves and our posterity. The enabling action. Do ordain. We declare the law. Enabling action number two. And establish. Bring into existence. What? This constitution. Those are the articles of incorporation for the trust. You know, all corporations are trusts. Are you aware of that? Yeah. You, you know, um, just as a side note, um, I've always advocated, uh, if you want to set up a trust, set up a corporation for profit or set up a non-profit corporation. To me, that's the best trust. Why is it the best trust? Because that's the trust that all the rich people use to protect their assets, their income, and get tax exemptions and the whole bit. And so if you, the IRS is not going to attack that trust. That, if you did everything, if you put, did everything according to that trust, uh, you're basically pretty much immune from attack if you follow all the little rules. And the rules are designed so that the government gets no money. Okay? <laughs> you know? It's not an accident that they're set up that way. You can set up other trusts, and other trusts are legally correct and everything, but what did you do? You ran up a red flag on the, you ran up the Jolly Roger on the flagpole, right? You said, come get me. So you can be right, and you can get a nice fight on your hands, maybe. I don't know, but just as a little aside, I like, I like uh, corporations and nonprofit corporations because of, of that. And I'm not taking away from the value of the other kinds of trusts. But if you really want to beat the system, that's how they all do it. That's why rich people don't pay taxes. What was it that... Uh, Leona, Helmsley. Leona Helmsley. That's right. She says only little people pay taxes. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so the, the um, trustee is the United States of America. And so... Here's the analysis here on this disc where it goes into that. It defines the context and in which the remainder of the Constitution must be interpreted. Most of it is self-explanatory. Here's an explanation that points to popular sovereignty. So you, you, but basically the preamble, you see when you talk to an attorney and you say, well, what's the significance of the preamble in the Constitution? And the answer I've always gotten was, well, is really no legal significance, but it, it just kind of uh, is an introductory kind of thing, you know. 